If you've got your copy of God's Word, I'd like to invite you to turn along with me to the book of Acts, chapter number 17. The book of Acts, chapter number 17. This morning we are going to be concluding our sermon series that we have been working through the book of Acts. During the course of this series we have been talking about some of the times when God did something for his church and for his people for the very first time. And this morning our text brings us to this passage of scripture in Acts 17 where we discover Paul in the city of Athens confronting worldly philosophy for the very first time. I think this morning in hearing what we have heard about missions, it is appropriate for us to begin in that place because over the course of the last few weeks as we've been talking through Acts, this same idea of of missions, of intentionally following the Spirit of God to talk to other people about Christ has been something that has been consistently cropping up through all of these sermons. And we began talking with Acts 1-8 where the Jesus is is ascending back to the Father and he leaves instructions for his disciples telling them to go out into the ends of the earth and to make disciples. We talked about the missionary calling just a couple of weeks ago of the Apostle Paul. We we talked about the first time that the, the gospel enters into Europe last week. And over the course of all of those sermons, there's been this kind of one consistent thing that I want us to understand. We sometimes confuse this idea of missions and assume that what that means is going somewhere in another zip code or another culture or another side of the world and talking to people there about Christ. And yes, that is mission, but missions is what happens when we share Christ where we are now. In that sense, we are all missionaries. We may not be missionaries to the Bengali people, we may not be missionaries in New York, we may not be missionaries on the other side of the world, but we absolutely are missionaries here in Tupelo, Mississippi. This is where God has rooted us and planted us. This is where he has established our church. This is where he has instructed us and led us and discipled us and taught us. And here we have been rooted and here we are going to do missions. We are missionaries to our communities to our homes, to our families, to our neighborhoods. But when we think about missions, and when we come to this passage of Scripture in particular, we can see some really interesting things about what it means to be a missionary and what ought to provide impetus to that mission that we are on. We will, over the course of the next few minutes, be talking about how missionaries are motivated by their surroundings. How missionaries must be faithful to their message and how missionaries, upon giving that message, are calling for a response, for people to do something with the Jesus that they have heard. And so with that in mind, let's turn our attention to this text of Scripture in Acts chapter number 17. And beginning in verse number 16, the word of the Lord says this. Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicureans and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Verse 22, so Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. 
What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. And even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance got overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed. Among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Let us pray. Lord, this is your scripture, your text this morning. And Lord, I pray that as we study it, Lord, as I preach it, that you would allow this text to, Lord, permeate our heart, to encourage us, Lord, to embolden us in our faith, to make us passionate about what you have done for us, but God, also that it would bring us to a place of repentance, Lord, that it would break us. Because, Father, we recognize that you are greater and higher and above all that we can understand. Lord, that you do not dwell in temples made with human hands. And Father, that you do not need us, but we desperately this morning need you. And so, Father, we pray this morning that you would pour your blessing out upon us. And this we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. As we begin, I want us to first draw our attention to this first handful of verses where we discover that missionaries, the Apostle Paul, is motivated by what he sees around him. That the surroundings that we enter into as God's people often ought to lead us towards a stronger devotion to God. Paul, for a brief amount of time, had split up with his traveling companions, and he was here in Athens without Silas and Timothy. But Paul's version of waiting is probably not like our version of waiting. He doesn't go out and put his feet in the sand of the Mediterranean. He doesn't hang out and soak up some sun. He begins to walk around the city of Athens and take in everything that he sees. And what happens is, rather than finding this a relaxing sightseeing tour, he finds himself, as the text tells us, provoked. That his spirit is provoked within him. Because he looks at the worldliness of the city of Athens and its residents and he is, well, he's fired up. He looks at what's going on and he says, this is not right. This is an affront to holy God. There is something wrong here. The people were an idolatrous people. Now, sometimes we think that the sin of idolatry is something that is not really a problem In our day, because let's face it, when is the last time you went to someone's house and up on their mantle you saw this carven wooden or stone image that they worshipped and bowed down to? And that's never happened to me. But that doesn't mean that idolatry is not something alive and well. Because while it may not be something that we fashion with our hands, it very much is something that we fashion within our hearts. It is very much something that we allow to grow and fester within us. I mean, in our context, an idol is anything that is revered, cherished, or valued above God. Which brings us to the question, what is our idol this morning? What is it that we are putting in the place of preeminence? If you really want to know, here's the test. 
Run down in your mind a list of things that are godly pursuits. Things that you know honor God. Reading the scripture, prayer, attending church, evangelizing, discipling, reading the word of God to your children. Fill in the list, right? These are things that honor God and lift God up. And then what does it take to get you to ignore one of those things? I mean, what is the threshold to get you to miss church? Right? Because we know we ought to be here in a place where God is honored and lift up and where we can worship with one another, where we can build up the saints. But then we start thinking about it and we go, I like church. But if I get an opportunity to go play golf, I'll do that. Or if it's opening weekend of deer season, I want to go do that. We'll start talking about this pursuit, this hobby, this thing that we enjoy and what we realize is the thing that we think ought to be important, this, this honoring God and lifting him up and being obedient to him, we put something else in its place. And in doing so, we remove Christ from the altar of our life, from the, from the throne of our heart, and we put something else in his place. Idolatry is alive and well in our world today. And unfortunately, it is alive and well in the hearts of so many of our church people. But the fact of the matter is that we are not grieved by our idolatry. At least not in the same way that the Apostle Paul is grieved with the idolatry of the Athenians. I mean, there are a lot of ways that we could respond to the wickedness of the world. In fact, there are a lot of ways that we do respond. I know people who, when they see the world traveling down a sinful trajectory, their response to that is anger. But not the sort of anger, provocation, infuriation that the Apostle Paul deals with where he is, he is upset, that he is, he is disturbed by what he sees and it makes him angry, yes, but it makes him passionate to see the gospel change. But some people just get angry for the sake of being angry. I know because some of y'all are on Facebook and I've seen it. That we are very good about holding people to the law and very poor about communicating to people grace. Sometimes we respond in anger. I know sometimes I respond in anger. Sometimes we respond with apathy. Let the world be the world. And if all society goes to hell in a handbasket, what difference does it make to me? We're going to let them be them and the church is going to be the church and we're just going to separate ourselves. And so when we see the, the world following after sinful, idolatrous, pagan relationships, it doesn't affect us. And we are apathetic towards it. I have seen people that when faced with the decline of the world, and maybe that's not even the right way to put it, but we see the world and the trajectory that it's on, we long for the good old days. That's not the way it was when I was a kid. That's not the world that I grew up in. and I wish things were the way that they used to be. Sometimes, unfortunately, people respond by just looking at it and saying, well, if everyone else is doing it, what's the harm? And I'll participate. If the world thinks this is a good time, let me go see if it is, and I'll go find out. We can respond to what the world is doing in a lot of different ways. But what I think the Apostle Paul gives us here in this passage of Scripture is a, a biblical response. What it looks like when we are dealing with and engaging with the sinful culture in a spiritually helpful way. What does Paul do? What is the biblical response to idolatry? Well, first he's offended by it. Telling us our response should not be apathy. Here's the thing, dear brothers and sisters, we cannot faithfully fulfill our missionary calling if we can look out on the sin of our world and not be affected by it. How are we going to take the gospel to a world that is hurting and desperate need of Christ, a world that is separated from God and headed towards judgment if we are not burdened by that? We are called as the people of God to function as salt and light 
in our world, but the truth is so many of us have lost our savor. Rather than try to engage with our culture for the gospel, we look at the rampant ungodliness around us and we have made a decision that the way to stay safe is to simply let the world be the world and let the church be the church. But we cannot fulfill our great commission. We cannot make disciples unless first we go out into the world where they are. The response to their sin was not just anger, but compassion and love. And we know this because of what the Apostle Paul does next. He isn't just angry. He doesn't just go to the men of Athens and tell them off. No, he sought to reason with these people where they were. He recognized that there was a need and he went to them. You see what the text of Scripture says? It says that he went to the synagogue. On the Sabbath day, he would go and he would reason with these spiritual people. And then every other day, he would go into the marketplace. Seeking to converse with whoever would listen. He went to them. You know, it's impossible for us to reach the world if we're not acting like we are part of the world. The harsh reality, dear church, and I say this with all of the love within my heart, we will not see our neighbors come to Christ. We will not see our neighbors come to church if we are not first willing to let them into our life and let them into our homes. Do you recall the biggest complaint that people had about Jesus was that he spent too much time with lost people? That he would intentionally seek out those people who were not the religious elites. The point of this is that we ought to be meeting people where they are. And I wonder sometimes, how did a gospel, like the gospel that is presented to us in the New Testament, a gospel of grace, a gospel for the brokenhearted, a gospel that says, come to me, all you who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. How did that extravagant love, how did that amazing sacrifice lead us to a place where we as the church of Jesus Christ, an outpost in his world, present a gospel that demands people to clean themselves up before they're welcome in our lives and in our churches? How does that happen? We must engage with our world where it is messy. And here's another thing about Paul. Do you realize who he talked to? He went and met these people where they were, and he was willing to talk to really anyone who would listen. He goes to the synagogue and he engages with the religious people of the day. And then he goes to the marketplace and he engages with the philosophers without hesitation. He didn't care if they were deeply religious or if they were deeply idolatrous. It made no difference to him. The Apostle Paul was willing to have a conversation about Jesus and the resurrection with whoever would listen. We find him talking to the Pharisees in the synagogue, yes. We also see him talking to the Epicureans. A very interesting philosophical school whose sort of whole motto to live by was eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. I mean, these people had no concept of the afterlife. They didn't really believe in the gods as something effective that mattered in their world. They thought the world is a place of suffering, so we should just make the most of it. I mean, these people are materialistic. Just what will make me happy in the moment? And how can I serve? And how can I get that, that rush of endorphins? How can I just feel better? And contrasted that, he also met with a group of people known as the, the Stoics. And man, two more unlike people you probably will never meet. These Stoics, they believe that everything comes from the mind of Zeus, their false god. And that a virtuous life is one that is in harmony with the divine reason. And so they were indifferent to pain and suffering as well as pleasure and joy. They just kind of tried to keep an even keel, as it were. In fact, if they had a motto, it would be, be good for goodness sake. 
mean, they felt like the only way to be right with the gods was to earn it. Moralism. And I cannot help but read about those groups of people and realize that you are going to meet these same groups of people. They may not go by names like Epicureans and Stoics, but you will meet people who are deeply devoted to a religion that is not right, who are misguided. You will meet people who are materialistic, and you will meet those who are counting on their goodness to make them right with God. And the Apostle Paul is willing to engage with every single one of these people, and so should we be. And I don't know if you noticed something else here, but Paul is also willing to engage with the world by enduring abuse for the name of Jesus. I mean, he was mocked and misunderstood, but he continued to share the truth with them. Do you see what they said to him? Here he is, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers who conversed with him, and some of them said, what does this babbler wish to say? And others said he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities. They did not understand. They called him a babbler, which sounds bad enough. But literally, it's translated as a seed speaker. And the picture that they have is, if you ever watched a bird walking around in a a fresh-cut yard, digging for worms and grubs and bugs and that sort of stuff, and just bobbing its head up and down? The name babbler at least in these philosophical circles, was designed to to describe someone who would just pick a little bit of this and a little bit of this and a little bit of this, and there there was no consistency and there was no logic to their philosophical worldview. They were just, I mean, truthfully, the word, they were calling Paul a fool. Someone who is unintelligent, someone who is lacking understanding, whose philosophical worldview makes no sense. He is illogical. He also was misunderstood because another group of people thought Paul was a polytheist. He's talking about not the God of the universe. He's not talking about the one God who rules and reigns and created all. But he is just trying to add to our pantheon two more gods. A God named Jesus and some God named Resurrection, Anastasis. And many of us fear to engage with our culture because we are so worried about the world might say. And when we are tempted to do that, what we find here in this passage of Scripture is that we ought to be following the example of Paul that preaches with boldness even though he faces ridicule. The text tells us that these men brought him to the Areopagus, the hill of Ares, the Greek god of war, the Roman god Mars, which is why this is known as the Sermon on Mars Hill. This is a place of debate, a place where new ideas are presented, but it's also a place where if you were to walk in, what you would find is yourself surrounded by idols. And all the people were curious to hear about something new. And let's hear what this man Paul has to say. He's willing to talk to us about it, so let's see what it is that he has on his mind. Which brings us to our next portion of scripture where we see that missionaries are faithful in their message. Whenever we are presented with the opportunity to share, Paul does so with with tact and with wisdom. You may not be aware of this, when the apostle Paul would go out into these cities, he he had a plan, something that he liked to do. He would first go into the synagogue and he would interact with the Jewish people. And whenever he's talking to Jewish people about Jesus, he begins that conversation by talking about the Old Testament, by talking about prophecy, by talking about the Messiah, by talking about the law, by talking about things that they recognized were true. But when he interacts with these philosophers and these these pagan idolaters, he has a, a totally different tactic. He doesn't approach them talking about those sorts of things, but instead he starts with what is unknown. He begins talking about the natural world. He begins by paying them a compliment, sort of. He says, I perceive that in every way you are religious. 
because as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I mean, I think you're religious. And truly, they were religious. They devoted their lives to a religion that could not save them. But they were devoted to it nonetheless. He says, I know you're religious people because I've seen the objects that you worship. There is no God behind that. There is no deity that is propping that up. It's just objects that you have made. But I, I, I perceive you're religious people. I mean, Athens was filled with some of the greatest temples of the ancient world. Idols and temples and monuments abound. You couldn't travel more than a few feet without bumping into one. The Greeks had invented a God for every situation. A God for this and a God for that. A God that brings the rain, a God that grows the crops, a God of war, a God of the sea, a God of life, a God of health, a God of everything that you can think of. But even their own worship betrayed the fact that there was emptiness in that. Because the Apostle Paul points out that on my way up here, I saw this monument, this idol inscribed to the unknown God. The point that Paul is making is that they knew that there must be something greater. They're making idols to unknown gods. There there must be something that can't be categorized, can't be contained, and can't be understood. I mean, their religion with its pantheon of gods was inadequate. Inadequate. And the unknown God was proof of that fact. They sought this God out of fear and ignorance, lest they had forgotten to pay homage to everyone. Lest we offend what we do not understand. And here's the thing. And here's really where it matters for us. Paul in his sermon is contrasting this feared, impersonal, unknown God with Yahweh. The God of the universe. The one who spoke the entirety of the cosmos into existence. The one who he writes and says gives us life and breath and everything that we have. It is this God who has determined the boundaries of our life. This God, Paul says, is not far from each of us. Because in him we live and move and have our being. He is contrasting their false worship with the true and living God. And Paul puts the true God of the universe squarely in opposition to these false gods and false worship of the Athenians and by default the rest of the empire. He says this God, the one that I am talking to you about, this one that I am proclaiming does not live in temples made by man. He is not in need of anything that you can offer him. He isn't fashioned out of gold or silver or carbon by man. He is not an image created in our imagination. Our God is not a God who needs us, but we are people who need him. That is the God that the Apostle Paul is proclaiming to these Athenians. A God who isn't sitting around waiting on their worship. A God who doesn't need anything. A God who is within his own existence, completely self-sufficient, with all of the joy and all of the love that would ever be needed. The fact of the matter is, God does not need us. We desperately need him. Why do we need him? Because we are sinful. Because our fellowship with Almighty God has been broken. Because we are dwelling under the curse, because we live under the sin of Adam, because we are unholy, and he is holy. We are lost. We have been separated from God. But the good news is that we have our being, our meaning in him. And this is our message to the world around us also. This is why we go beyond just giving information about the gospel because relationship with Jesus requires something more than that from us. It requires us to mold our lives to him, which is why missionaries call for a response. I mean, that 
begs the question, if there is this God who is the, the great God of the universe, who spoke everything into existence, the God who doesn't need us, the God who is transcendent and above us, then how can we ever come to a place where we can know him? He says the times of ignorance are past. We've been given a revelation of God through Christ. It's what the Apostle Paul has to say. Verse number 30, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. How do we respond to the gospel? Well, the first thing we need to realize is that we are responsible for the knowledge that we have. The time of ignorance has passed. The fact that you are here this morning, there is good news and bad news for you in that. The good news is you will hear the gospel and know what it means to follow Christ. And you can respond to that and you can believe and your life can be changed. But if you don't, you have heard the truth and you are responsible for the truth that you have heard. The time of ignorance is past. When we stand before the throne room of God, when we stand in the presence of the Almighty, we cannot plead ignorance. We cannot say we didn't know. Ignorance has passed. So what we need to do is we need to, the text tells us, repent. Repent of sin. And what is repentance? It's one of those church words, but what does it really mean? It means to turn. It involves a, a life change. The best way to describe it is, is think about it this way. In my life, before I knew Christ, I was walking in one direction. I was going this way, and in this way I was pursuing my, my sinfulness. I was pursuing what made me happy. I was pursuing materialism. I was pursuing lust. I was doing whatever I wanted to do because I was wrong and sinful and ungodly. But one day, the grace of God shined upon my life. The gospel was presented to me in a way that I understood it and I responded to it. I believed, I repented, and my life changed and turned. And where once I was pursuing these things, now I'm pursuing holiness and righteousness and obedience to God. That I am living in fellowship and right relationship with him. That I am being led by the Spirit. My life has changed. And when I sin, which happens all the time, it still requires that consistent repentance, realizing that when I do wrong, I did something wrong because I wasn't pursuing God, but I was pursuing the flesh. He tells us to repent, and he gives us the reason why, because judgment is coming. He commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And the assurance that he has given of who this person is is that he has raised him from the dead. He's talking about Jesus here. And I need to understand something. When we think about Jesus, we, we need a full understanding and picture of who Jesus is. Yes, Jesus is the one who suffers little children to come unto me. Yes, Jesus is the one who is love and shows love to undeserving people all of the time. Yes, Jesus displays mercy, but this text tells us there will come a time when that will end. That there will come a time, a day on which God has appointed when he will judge the world in righteousness. And in those days, Jesus will not be the lamb, but he will be a righteous warrior. The book of Revelation tells us riding on a white horse and carrying his recompense with him. What we need to understand is that what we are hearing and what we are responsible for today is something that has a time stamp on it. Because Christ will return, and when he returns, he will judge the world. Christ is that judge. He is the measuring stick. He is the substance of the new covenant. He is what we will be judged on. Ultimately, only one thing will matter when we stand in eternity before Almighty God. Only one thing will matter. What did we do with Jesus? Did we believe in him? Did we put our trust in him? 
Did we repent of our sin and confess that Christ is Lord? Did we conform our life to Him? John Stott in his book Basic Christianity puts it this way. When we think about what we should do, given this information, he says clearly we must do something. After all, Christianity is far more than accepting a series of statements about Jesus, true though they are. We may believe everything there is to believe about Christ and admit that we are indeed sinners in need of his salvation, but this does not make us Christians. We have to make a personal response to Jesus Christ. Committing ourselves totally to him as our Savior and Lord. Jesus never concealed the fact that his religion included a demand as well as an offer. Indeed, the demand was as total as the offer is free. His offer of salvation always brings with it the requirement that we obey him. In the story of Acts, there are three ways the people who hear this gospel message responded. If the gospel message is that Jesus Christ, the perfect, spotless, holy Lamb of God, was slain for your sin and mine, that his sacrifice would be applied to us if we would but believe, put our faith in him and turn from our sinfulness. If that is the gospel message, there are a lot of ways that people respond to it. Here in this text are three. The text says that some mocked. Don't do that. You may be hearing this message this morning and you're hearing all of that and it just sounds like some big cruel joke. Don't mock. Don't laugh. Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, is not one to be mocked. Some turned away and could have cared less. And the fact of the matter is there's a lot of people who hear the gospel and that is exactly what they do. But don't let that be you this morning. If you are an unbeliever, do not just turn away unhearing. We also find in this passage that some We're curious. Others said, we will hear you again about this. And that may be where you find yourself today because truthfully, it's very hard over the course of one church service to make this decision that will totally and completely change and alter the trajectory of the rest of your life. And I understand that. And you may be sitting there and thinking, I just want to, I want to know more. In just a moment when we have our closing. I'll be down front. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have, and we will continue that conversation as long as you want to take it. Some of you may just be curious about this gospel. And if that is you, I I challenge you this morning, satisfy that curiosity. Continue to ask questions and pursue the truth. The text also tells us that some believed, that some joined him, a man named Dionysius, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. This is the way that we should respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ, to believe him. If this is what the Spirit is calling you to do this morning, do not delay, but believe. Make that commitment to follow Christ as Savior and Lord. Just a moment when we close this service, I'll be standing down front. I would love to have an opportunity to just hear about what the Lord has brought in your life this morning. Tell me about that decision that you have made so that I can rejoice along with you. Dear church, I pray that our hearts are clear. And I pray that we are pursuing our mission as Christ has led us. Father, we are thankful for your love. Lord, thank you for this text and the reminders that it brings to us. God, I pray that it has been a challenge to our people. And Lord, I pray now that you would help them to respond to it as you have led them. In Jesus' name, amen.